How's it going people? Jack here with another reaction. So on this channel here, we like to chill, we like to feel good. And one way of feeling good sometimes has to do with the drip. The way that we dress, the way that we look to other people's or just to ourselves. Personally, I do like to treat myself with some nice clothes. And if this were to be a sponsored video, this is exactly where we'd be putting the ad. No, but on a more serious note, wearing nice clothes that feel comfortable, that also look good can feel great i am personally of uh, the option of always buying things secondhand if you can or spending money to buy some more expensive stuff because as we all know and all have noticed by now things are getting worse this is why i have been recommended this video here by the channel more perfect union on uh, why all clothes are getting worse now and why it's not just Shein who's doing that I'm shopping at Abercrombie for the first time since I was in high school. Mildly triggering because this was like the coolest store back in the day, but I can never afford it because my family is middle class. Now that I'm here, I'm noticing two main things. One is that everything is kind of affordable, which was definitely not the case in high school. The other thing that I'm noticing is that everything is just a little bit shittier than you would want it to be. Wow. I remember my girlfriend telling me about how bad Ab Abercrombie & Fitch was. I used to think, like when I was younger, that it was not a fast fashion uh, store. You know, uh, the likes of Zara, H&M. Uh, Personally, I was a Zara kid, but that has more to do with my build. They more or less exclusively sold stuff for like skinny people. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding here. I remember most of my classmates never wore the item that I had, either because some of them were on the bigger side and I was way skinnier than them, or maybe because they just didn't like how it looked. But yeah, stores like Zara, H&M, Topshop, uh, for my fellow weebs, you have Uniqlo as well. Those were considered to be fast fashions. Uniqlo, by the way, the first time that I entered one of those stores, made me feel like was I in a scene from ghost in a shell because it's a Japanese company like the aesthetic of the show of the store was kind of uh, pretty but I would have never considered Abercrombie & Fish to be a, a fast fashion store it was a bit more expensive back in the days Seeing a lot of like loose threads on things and a lot of stuff that's just made out of 100% synthetic fabrics the clothing oh. just doesn't feel like this nice firm Oil. high quality that I associated with Abercrombie Abercrombie still does sell some high quality clothing. Actually, I really like this dress and would totally buy it. And I'm glad they've decided to start using normal lighting in their stores. But seeing so much cheap and low quality stuff there made me wonder, did clothing used to be better when I was a teenager? The low lighting thing is a natural thing. Um, I think it was in a trip to Amsterdam. Some friends and I, we were going with the girls and we were just sitting. Oh, on the chairs there waiting for them to choose some items where if i can find it here literally a scene like this was something that I took a picture of where we were just laughing our asses off like they are definitely trying to hide some stuff here i think it was in an amani store actually one of the high ends that they're trying to hide some uh, defects on the items by lowering the lighting and making everything so dark but seeing so much cheap and low quality stuff there made me wonder did clothing used to be better when I was a teenager? Not just at Abercrombie, but across the board. So I scoured eBay, Depop, and Poshmark for clothes from trusted brands of the 90s and 2000s. Then I went to those same stores and bought the 2024 version of each item. Abercrombie was like legendary for really high quality denim. To compare the old and new, I got help from Amanda McCarty. I worked as a buyer in the fashion industry for about 20 years. In the span of my career, I saw how what we sell people changed. The two major changes I would say are one, nothing fits properly anymore. It's not you, it's nothing about your body, you're great. And two, the longevity of these clothes, even how you feel when you put them on. I, I would definitely agree, the thing with her body there. Because <laughs> I think many people tend to misunderstand that because we've all gotten so um, larger, because we're obviously overeating, a lot of us are doing so. Not because, not necessarily because we cannot control our urges, but sometimes also because it is the thing that are being pushed in our faces all the time. 
fast food. Although they claim to be providing healthier options, they are not really the same as where it to be more affordable for you to actually cook a meal for yourself. That being said, with the rise of fast fashion, as I said, with the Zara thing, they quite literally never had sizes for other body types than skinny. And you have got to wonder that has something to do with like the production value of uh, whatever they wanted to do. If they have to mass produce something, if they want to reduce cost, they are only going to produce one size of something or at least a limited amount of sizes. It's only on, like in very recent years because of the movement of like more body positive things that they started selling items for plus size people and things that fit better has degraded so much. It's just not a good deal. It's not just in my head. It has gotten harder to find quality clothes that last, even at brands you used to like. If mm. you're wondering why, keep watching. I want you to think about how many new pieces of clothing you bought last year. If you're anything like the average American, it was around 68. 68? What the? That's wild. I, I I think last year I bought eight. Yes, mainly shirts because shirts, unfortunately, do degrade quite a bit, especially if you work out a lot. And those were like mainly shirts like this one. And I, trousers, for example, I am in a bit more of a lucky situation, a little bit of free advertisement. The one that I'm wearing are made by my, um, girlfriend's aunt and uncle they are in the fashion industry and are actually working with a brand called um, bestseller at least they made their own group but off of an offshoot of bestseller which is like a uniquely uh, danish company and because it's not a massive one they of course have a lot of higher prices uh, you may know of the brand jack and jones it's not exactly too expensive, but it's expensive enough to mean that the production of the thing that they make are usually just localized or around Europe. Like for example, what I'm wearing right here is made in Bulgaria. <laughs> Found another piece of item here, which is these cargo pants, which are made of recycled dead stock. And it is made also in Istanbul, so Turkey. And naturally, the reason why I would prefer to buy stuff like that is because I know that it lasts way longer. Like the pants that I'm wearing have like four buttons. <laughs> so you know that expense have been put into it. And it of course also means that the people who are making it are working in places that have certain regulation for the workforce. So I don't have to worry about at least for the vast majority of my clothes today, I don't have to worry about whether or not they were made by some poor kid who was, yeah, suffering. But back to the main point, 68 is insane. In 1980, that number was 12. But wait, it gets crazier. In the 80s, Americans spent about 7% of their annual income on clothes. Today, it's just 3%. We spend half as much, even though we're buying five times more. This Abercrombie ad from the 80s helps explain why. The high quality wool was a huge selling point. They even tell you exactly where it's from. And notice how they say Scottish. this is part of their fall collection. Because in the 80s and 90s, stores only had new clothes Seasons. a couple times a year. Usually a spring summer collection and a fall winter collection. And designers would start working on each collection up to nine months in advance because clothing production takes a lot Just of work. Yeah. They had to think of hundreds of unique designs and whittle them down to the dozen or so best ones, send the designs to the factory, go back and forth with them for months to create a prototype, choose the best fabric, the right embellishments, and figure out the proportions for different sizes. After all that, they'd place a massive order with the factory and then just pray the design would. <laughs> yes. It's not like today where you have both AI algorithm and the constant feedback from people browsing on an app like has been shown many times with companies like Xi'an that you, they have like immediate feedback to the factories that tell them that just must produce some cheap stuff and then you know exactly that it's, that it's guaranteed to sell. It was kind of like a game of chance. You'd place two huge bets per year and if your styles flopped, you'd be stuck with a whole bunch of clothes you'd have to sell at a discount or just throw away. 
Oh. That risk is why so much care and thoughtfulness went into making each piece of clothing and why you could expect quality at every price point, even discount stores like Sears or JCPenney. Just look at the way JCPenney <laughs> JC advertised Penny. their suits in this ad from the 80s. Two-piece suits that are expertly tailored, classically designed, Oof. and have an elegant touch. They're not selling you on the price or the trendiness, but on the craftsmanship quality. and design. Even one of the cheaper suits on the market was still pretty high quality, which is probably why if you adjust for inflation, this $160 suit would cost $600 today. If you Dang. go to JCPenney now, you can easily get a two-piece suit for under $200. Look, I, I don't mean to brag when I'm saying this, but the pants that I'm wearing right now are $300 way more than an entire set of that it lets you know what the quality is so in the 80s and 90s people were buying fewer clothes but they'd be well-made pieces that would be worn for years and keeping up with all the trends well that was something only wealthy people could do yep. pull the latest brionis and charge them to our account yes ma'am what are brionis six months of my car payments plus a car then came a little store called Zara, and everything began to change. Oh boy, we're about to talk about the Inditex group, aren't we? Amancio Ortega, I believe, is the co-founder of the group and of course the president of Zara. He is, from last I checked, like the 12th or 13th richest man in the world. It's insane the amount of revenue that he got from that. Like you have under that um, because I have parents living in Spain now because they are taking their pension over there. They left me all alone in the cold of the north. But <laughs> yeah, you have companies like Bershka, Polar Bear, uh, a bunch of others. Uh, Massino Dutti, which I think is the only one there that is not exactly fast fashion. But out of all the brands that they have under the banner, all of them are fast fashion. And it's just cheap stuff. And like, I can't blame people for buying that. I understand. But you can limit your carbon footprint and all of the other things and actually get hold of good clothes if you buy secondhand or just wait, wear your clothes for longer. <laughs> The New York Times coined the term fast fashion in this 1989 article about the first U.S. store of Zara. So the latest trend is what we're after, a Zara executive told the Times. It takes 15 days between a new idea and getting it into the stores. Wow. Remember, that took most stores nine months. How did Zara do it in 15 days? By streamlining this part of the production process with something called grage goods. I thought that the term was something that only came after like the uh, 2008 uh, crisis because that's where a lot of people started not having money and then turned towards buying cheaper brands. <laughs> Inevitably, that's what happens. We can get into some American politics in a bit, but <laughs> I didn't know that it was so old of a term. Okay. Rather than manufacturing overseas, Zara built their own high-tech factories in Spain, all connected to headquarters by an underground monorail. There, robots working around the clock cut and dye fabrics to create unfinished, uncolored pieces that can be turned into any garment. Once a design is created, Zara can send those grage goods to their network of small shops in nearby regions, where they're transformed into finished dresses, trousers, and tops. Well, I'd be Instead tamed. of huge orders, Zara makes a small batch of each style to start with. The retail stores can then send feedback to headquarters about what's selling and what's not, and they can quickly ramp up production on whatever's popular, restocking within days if needed. It massively reduced the risk that came with clothing production. Instead of losing money on clearance sales or throwing away unsold goods, Zara's styles often sell out quickly. The designers don't have to predict trends a year in advance, they can just respond to fashion trends as they emerge, though sometimes that gets a little sketchy. For example, here's a look from the high fashion designer Celine from a collection that debuted on the Vogue runway in 2013. This skirt would have retailed for at least $1,000. 
And here's a very similar looking skirt selling on Zara's website for just $80. <laughs> According to the Wayback Machine, Zara had this skirt for sale by August, which would have been just a few, few weeks, weeks after Celine's version landed in boutiques. These runway knockoffs and how quickly Zara could get them into stores Jesus. were wildly popular. By August 2008, Zara's parent company Inditex became the world's largest fashion retailer. This is also when you had the rise of two other fast fashion giants of the new millennium, Forever 21 and H&M, H&M. which pioneered a new way to bring the runway to the masses. They partner with luxury designers to make exclusive lines for H&M at affordable prices, starting with Karl Lagerfeld in 2004. God, is it true? Of course it's true. This part of the story, it seems sort of like a win for the 99%. Fast fashion was making it so that anyone could wear runway designs while they were still popular. That was a new thing. And to be fair, who can blame people? when you have the constant need of variation satiated by affordable prices that feels good yeah we want the feeling of luxury without paying full price we want to look expensive ish <laughs> it's it's a feeling that is understandable for many of course encouraging lots of consumers to buy low-cost clothes that would go out of style quickly would shockingly have some downsides too but we'll come back to that because we can't give the minds behind Zara and H&M all the credit for the rise of fast fashion. We also have to give some credit to Bill Clinton? No, not because of his sick style. Wow. In 1994, President Clinton signed NAFTA, the North ah. American Free Trade Agreement, which made it cheaper to make clothes in Mexico. And a few years later, China. he normalized trade relations with China. Yeah. Textile factories started moving out of the U.S. because now clothing retailers had access to the largest pool of cheap labor in human history. Luckily, there was a law from the 70s, the multi-fiber arrangement, which limited how much clothing American and European countries could import from other nations. Unfortunately, the World Trade Organization let it expire in 2005, but of course. ushering the heyday of fast fashion. Because now, there was nothing stopping companies from producing everything in the countries with the lowest wages, the fewest labor laws, and the laxest environmental regulations. We've arrived at the fashion landscape that I remember from my teens. In the 2000s, you had four distinct buying options ranging in price and quality. High fashion or luxury brands, yeah. department stores, mall brands, and fast fashion. But the yeah, as I was saying, like Abercrombie and Fitch being on the same line as Urban Outfitters and Hollister, like obviously perhaps not the most expensive, but they were still like expensive-ish <laughs> in comparison to the rest below. But these days, it kind of feels like the bottom of this pyramid has collapsed and everything's a little cheaper and shittier. J. Crew, Anthropology, Abercrombie, these didn't used to be considered fast fashion, but now they arguably are. And that's because of two very big things that changed the experience of shopping into the hellscape of today. The first is the 2008 financial crisis. Yep. Middle-class consumers no longer had as much money to spend, Recession. so they began drifting over to cheaper options. While all of the other non-fast fashion retailers were struggling, Forever 21 was opening store after store after store. H&M, the same thing. Zara is spreading into other cities. And so the conversation began, how do we compete here? What if we continue to show the same prices on the price tags that we always have, but we know that we're gonna sell most of the units of that style on sale. And we plan for that. So let's say this dress costs $40 to make and it retailed for $100 in 2007. Yeah. In 2010, during the recession, the retailer would keep the price tag at $100, but expect that most pieces will only sell once it goes on sale. So they'll only spend, let's say, $15 to make it. So they'll still make a profit. <sighs> And how do you make clothes for cheap? Well, less. by making cheaper clothes. You add synthetic materials like yeah, polyester less of the good instead stuff. of selling pure natural fibers like cotton and wool. You skimp on details like pockets, buttons, and zippers, and yeah. offer less sizes. Yes. I could see all these things play out in the clothing I bought. 
like these men's jeans from Abercrombie from the 2000s versus now. The vintage pair weighs a hefty 761 grams and is 100% cotton. They feel substantial, long-lasting, really high-quality denim. They have a decent amount of distressing on here that was probably done by hand to sort of break down areas, make them softer. In the fast fashion era, a lot of this is skipped, where it's just like... Bro, jeans nowadays, that's the reason why you... you on most of the videos that I've had, you will likely have never seen me wear jeans. Like on most of the videos that I recorded, obviously for the most part, you are seeing from top, right? You most likely never see what I'm wearing underneath. I could be wearing underwear right now, you wouldn't know, but you've seen my pants already, right? But the thing that I'm saying is that in most videos that I recorded, I never wear jeans because if you're not buying the expensive denim, they feel so nasty. Dude, none of it is nice to wear on. I, I have like one pair that I've never touched ever since I got them as a gift. I don't buy jeans personally. I prefer like, uh, uh, what do you call it? Habit, ki kino pants? Yeah, we call it habit. Like let's just spray them with acid or do other things that are like, <laughs> actually like very toxic. The new pair weighs less at 720 grams and is a cotton elastane blend. This is yeah. that fast fashion trick of, okay, if we add a Elastane. little bit of stretch, it will fit more people theoretically and they'll be less likely to return them. But putting elastane in jeans shortens the lifespan pretty significantly. Those elastane fibers that are woven in here, when they're plastic them. and they break. And the more you wash them, the yeah. sooner they break. But you get into the cycle where you have to wash the jeans more often to get them to go back to size right. because they get stretched they stretch. out. The other main difference between these jeans, the zippers. We have a legit luxurious zipper, long lasting, 100% metal. They smoothly go up and down. Like these are things that you take for granted until you get a bad zipper. The new pair, when you were trying to unzip these, that sound, sound you can feel like this zipper is going to be a problem soon. Bruh, remember the days where you would apply like um, candle, candle wax on, on, on zippers to make them go better? Like we used to do that for like old bags, like when we actually had like the old sturdy leather bags for school. Dude, I had mine for like 10 years from primary school and so on. I didn't change it ever. <laughs> you, can't have, you can't have one of those anymore. Like I have a training bag here that I've had for the last eight years now. It has its wear and tears. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty beat up, but it's still functional. I don't need to buy another one, but it was also f expensive. So like yet another reminder that people are not necessarily being like brown nosed assholes when they are buying expensive stuff. It's actually to provide you with something that is long lasting. And that's why, again, as I said before, buying secondhand can be a lifesaver. This is a difference of maybe 50 cents, but it's a pennies game to get the pricing to work with the targets you're given. Another area that you can really see how quality degraded is with sweaters. We compared an anthropology sweater from today to a vintage sweater made in the 90s. This sweater is Liz Claiborne, which is like anthropology before anthropology. The vintage sweater is 100% wool. The one made today is 100% polyester. The vintage sweater has metal buttons. The other one has no buttons at all. The vintage sweater is a size medium. The one made today is one size. When I see one size in something, I'm like, oh, it's because they couldn't afford to buy it in sizes to meet the margin targets. Even with all these cost-cutting measures, it also traditional looks cheap. retailers were struggling. And that's around the time private equity firms started buying them up, saddling them with debt, and letting all the business decisions be made by finance bros whose idea of fashion is that Patagonia vest over a game. <laughs> they all dress like that. And the same thing is happening in gaming. Private equity firms always ruining shit. God damn it. And people are gonna blame all this stuff on, oh no, it's the body positivity movement that is ruining clothing and fashion. Oh no, it's the DEI that's ruining gaming, where quite literally some business bros are out there. Listen! The company is over. Gingham shirt. And on top of all that, there's still that other huge change that I mentioned, the final death knell in quality clothing, the internet. 
Social media and fast fashion are a match made in heaven. Social media helps shorten our attention spans, which extends to fashion trends too, which cycle through faster and faster. That makes fast fashion indispensable to influencers who rely on a steady stream of new clothes for their content. This puts pressure on all of us to wear a totally unique, never before seen outfit every single day, which is pretty hard. <laughs> Lizzie McGuire, you are an outfit repeater. And? I guess now it's time to talk about Shein, Zara's more chaotic little sister, the logical conclusion of fast fashion. Shein is a company that focuses on selling as much hyper trendy, super low quality clothing they can for mind blowingly cheap prices. Shein raked in close to $10 billion in 2020. <laughs> it's currently the biggest clothing retailer in the world, even beating out Amazon in the US. Shein is not just fast fashion. $10 billion. Uh what was, what was the net worth of the CEO of Zara? 70 billion, I think, circa. Holy shit. And they made that just in 2020. And people are buying that. It's, that's the other part of it. Like, for example, people who are buying stuff on Timu, right? You're seeing an ad for a, a pair of shoes for like $3. Bro, there's something wrong with them. There's got to be something wrong with them. Like you cannot be serious and actually spend money on that. And beside the whole thing with actually bad uh, clothes being sold to you, are the regulations for the product that you actually receive. Chemicals that are involved in it, how bad it can damage your skin. Um, <laughs> my girlfriend works for a company that sells children's toys. It's a local one, so they only have like a couple of stores in the country but the one that she works at is not too far away from where we live. And her boss was on national TV the other day talking about how the regulations that the EU has against uh, towards companies like uh, Timu was way too lax, especially with children's toys. Like there have been so many cases of children being choked out by stuff that were not supposed to because stuff breaks up. It's mad. It's really mad. Also, like the, there is a certain moral standard, I guess, that the customers themselves should be holding themselves to. Like if you're laying something like that bare in front of you, I understand that we are all not doing great in this economy, but man, think about the things that are actually hurting you rather than what you can temporarily gain. It's instant fashion. Zara can get products from drawing board to store in 15 days, Shein can do it in three. Zara can release 35,000 new items of clothes per year, Shein will release that many in just a couple weeks. So how do they do it? Rather than functioning as a cohesive clothing manufacturer with its own factories like Zara, Shein is more like Amazon, a huge marketplace selling clothes from thousands of independent Chinese factories. And it treats those factories sort of like Uber treats its drivers. The factories yeah. are hooked up to Shein software that collects real-time feedback about which items are selling well and which aren't. The software then sends alerts to the factory owner's phones to ramp up or slow down production. It's Zara's small batch production on steroids. And just like other billionaires, Shein finds creative ways to avoid US taxes. Yeah. See, when you buy something from Shein, your clothes are shipped to you directly from the factory in China. There's no big Amazon style warehouses in the US full of Shein dresses. And since packages valued at under $800 can enter the US duty free, Shein merchandise bags. is pretty much always exempt from consumer goods tariffs. That exemption, it's called de minimis, was originally created so you could buy a rug or a lamp while you're on vacation and ship it back to yourself without having to pay tariffs. Ah, uh, yes. My dad uses that. He sells knives. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I've mentioned this on videos many times, but my old man has been gifting me knives for the longest time. And that's through such a method that he... Uh, as uh, sells them. <laughs> it's messed up. Not for big clothing retailers. 50 years of fast fashion and ultra fast fashion has completely changed our relationship with clothes. Instead of being something to cherish and care for, they're now just another cheap and disposable plastic consumer good. 
thanks to fast fashion, clothing retail is in a race to the bottom death spiral. Everything is fast fashion now. And the thing is, all this overproduction, it doesn't just affect clothing quality. When private equity and fast fashion companies greedily maximize their profits no matter what the cost, that hurts workers across the entire textile supply chain. Now, yeah. mass producing clothing has always relied on extremely exploitative labor and dangerous working conditions. But guess what? Ever since the Ronald Reagan time, we're talking about like the 80s, 81, yeah, that's when he uh, took office. <laughs> they, for the US that is, uh, deregulated unions, for example. Union busting became a thing where workers most likely don't have a say in anything. And that's why people have been mobilizing and actually reunionizing in the last few years to regain that ability. But as the industry gets bigger, the casualties and abuses do keep growing. Like when a garment factory collapsed in Bangladesh in 2013, killing over a thousand workers. But oh, the fast shit. fashion companies that produced clothes there hardly faced any accountability. So it's no surprise that nearly 10 years later, a 2021 investigation by Public Eye, a Swiss human rights group, showed that factories that supply Xi'an are crowded and unsafe, with blocked emergency exits and people regularly working over 75 hours a week. Oh, Slavery shit. Slavery is still an issue too. According to recent investigations, anywhere between 20 and 30% of clothes being sold in the US contain cotton from Xinjiang, Xinjiang, a region in China with cotton farms that rely on forced labor from Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities. The prices that we are offered on these clothes that are the prices we're willing to pay are not based in a reality where everybody involved is paid a living wage of and works under not. good conditions. I mean, they're built off of cutting corners and exploitation. Now, I want you to once again think of all those new clothes you bought last year. How many of them will you still be wearing next year? The year after? The average American gets rid of 81 pounds of clothes per year, and that's nothing compared to the hundreds of billions of pounds of unsold clothing and returns that manufacturers and retailers throw away. No one actually knows how much exactly it is, but we do know that you can see the world's textile waste from space. Yo, I am willing to bet that our future archaeologists will be probing our grounds and being like, oh, so uh, the previous generations did find a dinosaur or juices back in the mid 1800s. That was nice uh, to no longer extract them from whales. So uh, what about this other mass here? It looks less fluid, a bit more uniform. Yeah, that is also a form of uh, polyethylene. Uh, that is extracted from oil, right? Sure. But why is it so much more of it? And what does it have to structure? Those are clothes. What? We are going to freak out our future generations with the way that we've been doing things. It is mad that we can see the clothes out of space. Yikes. I know that it's also trash in space with like uh, all the debris of uh, the different apparatus that we have left there in orbit, but God damn. This mountain of discarded clothes in Chile's Atacama Desert grows by 39,000 tons per year. The polyester that's in almost all clothing these days will take centuries to decompose. None of this bad PR is slowing down textile production at all. Shein is on the verge of an IPO on the London Stock Exchange with a $64 billion valuation. That kind of stuff makes the fast fashion industry seem unstoppable. But there are people fighting back. First, there's that de minimis tax exemption we talked about that allowed Shein to evade tariffs. A bipartisan group of lawmakers are trying to close that loophole. Meanwhile, New York lawmakers have introduced legislation to create, for the first time, legally binding environmental and labor standards for the industry. They're trying to do the same thing here in the EU with regards to companies like Timu to add in a tax so that people cannot just so easily get their plasticky thingies to stick to their phones. And dozens of brands have been investigated for using cotton from Xinjiang, including H&M, Nike, Uniqlo, Burberry, and Shein. But there's still a lot to be done, and the industry is going to fight every step of the way. Remember when I said Shein's IPO is in London? The reason they're not doing it in New York is because they didn't want to comply with US regulations that would force them to make disclosures about forced labor in their supply chain. Oh, shit. They haven't given up, though. 
they're lawyering up and lobbying against those regulations. This is what happens when you get out of the EU. Britain, you become one of the bad guys. Fast fashion is the story of unchecked corporate greed in a bargain for lower prices for, well, you. Though, as we've shown, that hasn't actually worked out for consumers. We need lawmakers to continue cracking down on corporations like Shein, because we all deserve clothes that look and feel good, but don't require exploiting workers and destroying the planet just to be affordable. Yeah. Thanks for watching The Classroom. Deadly Drip. We're always looking to tell more stories like this one, exposing greedy corporations and unpacking economic systems that impact all of our daily lives. What other issues do you want to see us cover? Sound off in the comments. And again, don't forget to like and subscribe. I just think that we all owe Michael Moore an apology. He was trying to tell us something where he made thrift shop. He knew that this was going to happen. But man, it is kind of sad and a weird stage that we find ourselves in. And that's why we have to like be even more careful with jumping on trends and things like that. Like whenever I hear about Swifties, for example, not attacking you guys, okay? Not coming after your queen, but you have to admit, whenever it is that she holds a concert and all of you must have matching dresses, it causes a change in the carbon footprint. And how often are you going to wear that thing before you throw it out? But this was a great recommendation. Thank you so much for this. And of course, if you're interested in knowing more about things such as workers' rights, please do make sure to go and subscribe to the More Perfect Union channel. That being said, thank you so much for checking out this video. Hopefully this was uh, uh, fun and also educational video for you to watch. And wish you all to have a wonderful day. See you guys in the next one. Bye.